Hello and welcome to Every Dark Elf Lord Ranked From Worst To Best. This is the second in a series of videos where I'm going to be ranking all of the legendary lords within their own factions. This is all leading up to me ranking every single legendary lord in the game, so be sure to subscribe if you want to catch that. First I'll go over the rules and criteria. I'm going to be focusing on the campaign rather than multiplayer because it's kind of my thing, and also anyone can make anything work in multiplayer if they are good enough. I'm going to be taking into account everything I can that's specific to the Lord and Faction. This includes the unique effects they bring to their faction, the effects they have on their army, and of course the Lord themselves and their performance in battle. I'd also like to preface this by saying that this is based on my personal experience and opinions, it's by no means facts, this is just how I believe each Lord is ranked in power. But first, time is running out to get 10% off your order on the Colonel Damders merch store. Until the 1st of May, you can get 10% off all orders using the code SEXYGROM at checkout. If you've ever wanted to pick up a bit of merch, be it the brand new, the thickest one, or the classic logo, then there's never been a better time to do it. All purchases on the store go directly towards supporting the channel, and I can't thank anyone that buys anything enough. So if you're interested, head on over to colonelldamders.store to check out everything. Also, if you do buy anything, be sure to take some pictures and tag me on Instagram and Twitter, I'd love to see them. I'll now return you to your regularly scheduled ranking. Now without further ado, let's get started with number 6. Coming in last place is Malus Darkblade, which I don't think will come to any surprise to anyone. He's a very rough start in the southeast of the map, being so far from any allies. He also has dual starts on literally opposite ends of the world, but he gets some points back for being allowed to give the Nagron settlement back. Unfortunately, if you do that, you are then stuck completely alone in the bottom right of the map, which is swarming with lizardmen and rats and everyone who is not going to be your friend. As for his faction mechanics, the back and forth battle for possession of Malice offers some tempting bonuses for both sides of the coin. The Whispers of Sarkhan offer some tempting rewards for cruel acts. He gains increased income from mines and quarries and allows you to have some very robust income if you pick your settlements. And he also starts from a military alliance with Nagrond, although it won't do you much good since you are so far away. For his personal army, he reduces the recruitment and upkeep costs for Cold One units and has a plus 10% chance of intercepting an army using the Underways. This will be mostly used in your battle against Deathmaster Snitch. For his starting units, he gains Cold One Knights, which are a slower, heavier dinosaur cav, a Blood Rack Medusa, which is a very powerful, high single target damage artillery monster, and Scourge Runner Chariots, which are a multi-class chariot unit with decent damage in both melee and range. As for himself in battle, it really depends how much the possession is taken over. If it is completely taken over, then he is incredibly powerful. He has heavy armor and great armor piercing damage. When possessed fully, he can transform into Zarkhan to basically reset his stats and get a whole new set of abilities. He does constantly drain health when this happens, but you get a full health bar so it's okay really. You fight the first battle as Malice and have him take and deal a bunch of damage, and then when he's on Death's Door, just have him transform and then he can go right back into the battle. He also has his unique Cold One mount called Spites, which gives him a load of speed and some damage. With all his abilities and items, he gains regeneration and even more buffs for himself. The reason for ranking him this low is pretty much because of the starting location. If it wasn't for that, he'd probably be quite near the top, but so goddamn far away from any allies or even confederations that if you even think about getting involved in too many wars, you'll be taken out in no time. As a battler, he is very strong and the possession mechanic can do you a lot of favours, but none of it is enough. Coming in 5th place, we have Marathi. Now her faction starts in the Central America that connects Lustria to the Frozen Mountains. She gets attacked by about 5 different factions in the first few turns as I found out, and that was immense pain. She also has Chaos Corruption which just absolutely sucks. She has a focus on heroes with less upkeep and action costs for them, as well as getting cheaper sorcery buildings. Her only other campaign strength is better relations with other Dark Elves due to her <clears throat> charms, her, um, both of her big massive charms. Even her army is very charming, she inspires loyalty when nearby to other lords, by reminding them who's um, <clears throat> in charge. She also improves the Sacrifice to Hecate right by reducing its cost and cooldown, and her starter units are a War Hydra, which is top tier, especially in the early game, Witch Elves, which are a mid-tier anti-infantry infantry, and Dark Rider repeats crossbows, which are a decent early game armor piercing ranged cavalry. As for herself in battle, she is a simple spellcaster. She does have decent AP damage with a bonus versus large, but she obviously has no armor, but she also has no resistances, so struggles versus pretty much everything. Her one mount just gives her better speed and a tiny, tiny bit of armor, but it's still not enough for anything other than gentle combat. She also has access to the Law of Dark Magic, and with all her items and abilities, she can push out a large number of debuffs to enemies. The reason for her rank is the very vulnerable starting position, needing to take Chaotic Corruption with you wherever you go, her poor battle performance compared to other lords, and no real army buffs. She's just very basic. She's not as horrific as Malice because she's relatively close to the other Dark Elf, so eventually she can get some allies and confederations, but she's still not great. Coming in fourth place, we have Loki Felhart. Now his faction starts on an island just off the coast of Lustria. <laughs> He's kind of like a pirate lord that also happens to be a dark elf. 
He gains the unique sacrifice to Anathrema, which involves income from stacking and raiding. He gains 50% income from slave pens and markets, and every major port he owns increases the Black Ark capacity, meaning he can get more Black Arks and make more profit from them than anyone else in the game. As for his personal army, he gains 50% upkeep reduction for Black Ark Corsair units, which is just massive amounts of value right out the gate. He gains fear for all Corsair units, and his army gains immunity to high seas, reef and storm attrition, meaning they can roam the seas with relative ease. For his starting units, he gains Shielded Dark Shards, which are an early game armor piercing ranged unit, a Feral Manticore, which is that one unit that nearly every single faction can recruit, and Black Heart Corsair Handbows, which are a good mid-game skirmishing infantry. Himself in battle, he is arguably the best straight-up fighter in the Dark Elf roster. He is very heavily armored and does high damage, especially versus infantry. He also has a great mount in the form of his dragon, Maelstrom. Once he gets all his items and abilities, he grants a multitude of bonuses to himself, as well as regeneration, making him into a very, very formidable fighter. The reason for his rank being so low is that the lustrous start is always a pain. There are lots of people in there, and very, very few of them will want to be friends. He doesn't have any great army buffs either, and the units he does affect aren't as useful later in the game. He's of course a very strong lord in battle, but he is still quite basic, having no access to spells or real army buffs. Taking our third place position is Crone Helbron. She starts next door but one to Malekith, so decently central to what the Dark Elf lands. Her faction revolves around Death Knights and Blood Voyagers. Keeping the Blood Knight bar as high as possible gives the faction all sorts of massive bonuses, and this becomes more expensive as the campaign goes on. But also, if you're playing the Dark Elves right, you should always have a few slaves handy. If the bar does get too low, however, you do start to suffer the penalties, and this can send you into a real spiral. She gains plus 2 capacity for death hags and captures plus 25% casualties post battle. She gains the unique sacrifice to Jakira, which improves death hags and witch elves and everything that's fighting a high elf. She also gains a reduction to the sacrifice of cane cost. Her personal army gains minus 50% upkeep and plus 10% weapon strength for witch elves, sisters of slaughter, and hagen of executioners. The starter units are hagen of executioners, which are great sword units, so a great armor piercing anti infantry units. Sisters of Slaughter, which are kind of a utility infantry unit with very high defense and poison attacks. And Dread Spears, which are your bog standard starter spears unit. As for herself in battle, she's basically a souped up death hag. She gets great damage stats and can shred infantry by herself. She obviously has low armor, but also has resistances to make up for it. She also has poison attack, which if you ask me, is the best imbuement, if that's a word, for a weapon to have. She has okay mount options, especially the Cauldron of Blood. And with all her items and abilities, she gets a staggering number of bonuses to herself, as well as auras around her. The reason for her rank is that the Blood Knights can make your faction very, very strong, but the constantly approaching debuffs mean you either never have any slaves, or you have to accept being penalised. The units she buffs are niche picks most of the time, and the buff she gives them doesn't really change this. She's a very strong battler and can make up a significant part of your army's killing power, but compared to the value the other two bring on the whole, she can't really match them. Now coming in second place, we have Malekith. His faction starts in the centre of the Dark Elf lands, which means either strong alliances or massive infighting. The only real campaign strength he has is the quicker confederations of Malice due to the strong alliance, and Marathe due to the good, wholesome, mothersome relationship. He also gets more loyal new recruits, but the loyalty bonus will be negligible if they become a higher ranker than him, so grind his levels as fast as possible. Giving XP to other lords is annoying when trying to get into the max, but once max rank is achieved, it allows quicker leveling of other lords. His personal army gets much cheaper upkeep for most of the core infantry units of the faction, and that's about it. As for his starting units, he gets cold one chariots, and you know I don't really like chariots, but this multi-class one is decent. He gets the Black Guard of Nagarond, which are top of the line anti-large infantry, and the Reaper Bolt Thrower, which is a great multi-class artillery. In battle, he's a melee expert with extremely high armor and a shield, meaning he is super tough to take out. He also does high damage, though not majorly armor piercing, so will struggle against extremely armored targets. He also gets access to the lore of dark magic, so can both attack on the front lines and help out his units with spells. He has nice mounting choices, especially Seraphon the Black Dragon, and with all his abilities and items, he can be a massive thorn in the side of the enemy spellcasters. The reason for his rank is that he is the most straightforward legendary lord, and is the easiest faction to manage, pretty much because he was the first one to be added. He also has a central location to allies, meaning he has a nice buffer keeping most enemies at arm's length. The cheap upkeep for core units and units that he'll be using all the way through to the endgame is really useful, and being great in combat and a powerful spells caster means you can't go wrong with him in battle. And taking first place is the most recent addition to the Dark Elf roster, the free LC Lord, Rakarth. Now his faction starts Albion, which looks pretty scary with the close proximity to High Elves and the Empire, but with this guy, it is so easy it doesn't even matter. The monster pens mechanic make it too easy to farm monsters, meaning you can take the Empire before turn 50. 
and the lack of penalties for being raiding stance means you can farm free money and monsters with basically no penalties aside from limited movement range. And the minus 10% upkeep for all monsters means you can field even more of these vicious beasts and there is nothing the enemy can do about it. As for his personal army, he gains 8 melee defense and minus 1 recruit duration for all monsters. So even if you're not using the monster pens, you can get even more monsters even faster and they will have an even easier time surviving. As for his starting units, he gains Great Sworded Shades, which are the best Dark Elf ranged infantry units in my opinion. He gains War Hydra, which has great armor piercing damage and slaughters in the early game. And the Reaper Bolt Throw, which is that fantastic multi-class artillery piece. As for Rakarth himself, he's a heavily armored anti-large fighter with great armor piercing damage. He also has some nice mounts, especially his unique Dragon Bratches. With all items and abilities, he can buff himself and allied units, especially large units, quite a substantial amount. Now the reason for his rank, it may just be because he's still quite new, but he just feels incredibly overpowered, purely due to the ease of use of his mechanic. The beast pens allow him to farm monsters at a rapid rate and use those monsters to farm even better monsters and use those monsters to eat the empire before like turn 50. He might not be the most incredible lord in combat, but his faction and mechanics are just that powerful that it doesn't matter, he eclipses everything that any other lord could bring to the table by simply being a good fighter. These mechanics are usable by every single army in his faction, which means that no matter where you are, you can always get a buttload of monsters in the span of a single turn. Thank you for watching this video ranking the Dark Elf Lords from worst to best. If you'd like to see other videos ranking all the legendary lords from other factions, then be sure to subscribe to the channel. I'd like to take this time to thank all supporters of the channel, especially Kobe said so and Nifty Norm. Your level of support of the Unclean Ones tier is truly insane, and I really can't thank you enough. One more thank you for watching, and for now, I've been Colonel Demders, and I will see you next turn.